Hello everyone. Um, today we will be talking about uh, neuromuscular disorders. Uh, this is a very uh, big topic, obviously, because um, anytime we uh, say neuromuscular disorders, we are referring to all these disorders that um, affect the peripheral nervous system, as opposed to the central nervous system. So that would include, you know, the uh, <clears throat> motor neuron disease and the muscles and the nerves and and roots. Um, would we'll try to have uh, an organized uh, approach uh, based on localization. So uh, we'll start uh, with the definition of the motor unit and then we'll start to take uh, the important uh, uh, disorders or diseases that affect different parts of the peripheral nervous system and collectively or together uh, that's what we refer to as neuromuscular disorder. So, um, the peripheral nervous system uh, obviously uh, consists of the two main types of neurons, the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. Um, anytime we talk about weakness uh, of uh, uh, peripheral nervous system uh, etiology, meaning weakness uh, in any neuromuscular disorder, that means that we're talking about lower motor neuron uh, uh, condition. And... Uh, uh, lower motor neurons, <coughs> uh, obviously the cell bodies are located in the anterior horns and from that, uh, from there the roots will come out and uh, uh, they will um, be joined with the uh, sensory neurons in the spinal uh, nerve uh, in the root that come, to, come out of the spinal cord um, and uh, then go and uh, different roots will join together and form plexus and, uh, and go to the muscles. Um, it's a very important concept to keep in mind that the uh, uh, motor neurons, or lower, especially lower motor neurons, are not just uh, the ones that originate from the spinal cord. Uh, there are also um, lower motor neurons that generate uh, from the brainstem. They come out of the uh, motor nuclei um, in the brainstem. So, for example, the facial nerve, the seventh cranial nerve, um, <clears throat> consists primarily of uh, uh, a lower motor neuron that uh, uh, come out of the uh, brain stem and go and array different muscles in the face. Same uh, for the hypoglossal nerve, which is the 12th cranial nerve. Same for the 3rd, 4th, and 6th uh, cranial nerves that uh, innervate the extraocular muscles. While at the same time, within the same nerve itself, you may have other fibers in addition to the motor fibers or motor neurons and the example would be the uh, the third cranial nerve where in addition to the motor uh, neurons or motor fibers you have the <coughs> uh, parasympathetic uh, fibers also uh, or for example the trigeminal nerve which is primarily sensory neurons but in addition to that there are some motor neurons that would go to the masseters um, now uh, so, so that's important. Anytime we talk about lower motor neuron, we need to always imagine the anterior horn cells sending out these lower motor neurons in all these uh, different uh, spinal cord segments uh, from the cervical all the way to the lumbar spine. And in addition to that, the lower motor neurons that come out of the uh, motor nuclei in the uh, brainstem. Um, an important a concept in a peripheral nervous system or neuromuscular uh, uh, field is something called the motor unit. The motor unit is <clears throat> simply the motor neuron itself uh, consisting of the cell body and the axon and the myelin and the neuromuscular junction in addition to these muscle fibers that are innervated by this specific neuron. So uh, the muscle contains uh, many, many mus different muscle fibers. Um, the same muscle will receive uh, multiple neurons that are coming all together in, in one nerve. Uh, each neuron will control a group of muscle fibers. If that neuron is diseased, these muscle fibers will be affected or what we call denervated. However, if the adjacent neuron that goes to different muscle fibers uh, is still intact, then the conductivity through that neuron will still be working and these muscle fibers 
will still contract and do their job completely normal. Uh, <clears throat> so in that case, we have two motor units. One of them is uh, impaired and the other one is intact. Uh, although the neurons are, both of them are coming within the same now, uh, this here we um, uh, are trying to refresh our memory and uh, uh, remember the different parts of the peripheral nervous system. I think m many of you are probably familiar with, the, uh, with this graph here. Uh, the peripheral nervous system consists of um, anterior horn cell, or, or uh, talking primarily about the lower motor neuron here, uh, it consists of um, anterior horn cells. And if you have anything that goes wrong with anterior horn cells, then we call it uh, a motor neuron disease. That's kind of the umbrella that will include different types of, of diseases and conditions. Uh, and then <clears throat> the root. Uh, and if you have anything goes wrong with the root, then that we call that condition radiculopathy. And then these multiple roots and different levels, they uh, get together and they form a tree of, of uh, multiple connections of different roots. That tree of nerves, we call it plexus, and anything that's wrong with the plexus, we call it plexopathy. Uh, and then from the plexus, you get multiple different nerves that run um, from the plexus all the way to the muscles, and uh, <clears throat> those what we call nerves. The nerves are connected to the muscle through uh, a neuromuscular junction, and anything goes uh, uh, goes wrong there, we call it uh, neuromuscular junction uh, disorder. And that is different from the general term of neuromuscular disorder. Here we're talking about specifically the neuromuscular junction uh, disorder. And uh, then the muscle itself with, the all, with all the muscle fibers. And anything goes wrong with the muscle, we call it myopathy. Just like if anything goes wrong with the nerve, we call it neuropathy. So those terms are very well defined. And uh, each of them uh, refers to a part of the uh, peripheral nervous system. Now, <clears throat> also in the peripheral nervous system, we have the sensory nerves, you know, starting with the receptors in the skin and then uh, going through the uh, sensory nerves that are commonly combined within the same nerve, so median or ulnar or radial. They contain both motor fibers and sensory fibers where the signals are going both ways. So these signals and the sensory nerves are coming out from the periphery, going uh, through the nerves, through the plexuses, through the roots, but uh, instead of the anterior, they go through the posterior um, horns, and from there, there they synapse with their, uh, or they continue actually, or they may uh, cross to the other side, and then they continue their tracks um, uh, or corresponding tracks based on what sensation is that, uh, all the way to the brain, uh, uh, to the thalamus primarily. This is the uh, sensory relay station and from there to the uh, sensory cortex or other types of the uh, cortex. Now, uh, <clears throat> we, a very important concept to, to uh, uh, remind ourselves with before we start uh, this lecture is the difference between central nervous system and peripheral nervous system. One of the best ways to differ differentiate between them is obviously the upper versus lower motor neuron signs. With the upper motor neuron, we have hyper reflexia and hypertonia and with the so spasticity with the lower motor neuron or peripheral nervous system we have hyporeflexia uh, and hypotonia flaccidity uh, in addition to that with the central nervous system uh, problems meaning upper motor neuron disorders we have babinski sign and we have clonus um, while with the peripheral nervous system lower motor neuron um, conditions or disorders we have um, atrophy and we have fasciculations. Uh, <clears throat> anytime we see one of these features, it simply suggests that we're dealing with the lower motor neuron and that means a peripheral nervous system and then from there we just need to further localize within the peripheral nervous system. Um, we do not have to have all the features. So if someone has neuropathy or, or myopathy or uh, um, radiculopathy, they don't have to have decreased reflexes plus um, a decreased tone plus atrophy plus fasciculations. Any one of those uh, is enough. Um, the more the better, of course, and the uh, more secure the diagnosis will be. Uh, <clears throat> the um, a few things here that I have added to, to this slide that are of extreme importance to help us 
um, localized within the peripheral nervous system. Uh, some of them are not absolutely reliable, uh, but they are fairly re reliable. For example, if someone has, if, if we have a case of someone describing some symptoms in one extremity only and does not involve, you know, uh, upper and lower extremities, it does not involve both sides, obviously, it's just one extreme, one arm on one leg. <clears throat> obviously, um, naturally, you're going to be considering things like um, uh, radiculopathy, plexopathy, and uh, mononeuropathy, just one nerve deal. It, it, logically speaking, it makes the possibility of myopathy, for example, uh, or, um, or uh, uh, polyneuropathy, it just becomes almost impossible. It's, it's extremely rare for a myopathy. There are few, but it's extremely rare for a myopathy to affect just one extremity strictly and doesn't cause any other problems. Uh, <clears throat> if you have pain in the spine, for example, or more importantly, radiating pain down the arm or the leg um, with some symptoms, whether they are sensory only or motor only or both, then that pain itself obviously is going to make you think uh, more of um, uh, radiculopathy. Anytime we have upper and lower motor neuron signs in the same patient in a non-localizing pattern, meaning in a pattern that cannot be explained by uh, a spinal cord condition or, or uh, something else, then that's obviously um, the, the indicator of a motor neuron disease. Um, if someone has bilateral symptoms, really symmetric, um, and they are uh, uh, sensory symptoms, mostly distal, for example, in the, in the feet, then that's how neuropathy starts. Versus if someone has only motor symptoms, no sensory symptoms whatsoever, then you certainly would exclude things like radiculopathy uh, or neuropathy, <clears throat> even though there are pure motor neuropathy, but that is relatively uncommon. What's more common, actually, is... Uh, that, uh, uh, or more likely, I would say, is that you're dealing with myopathy, neuromuscular junction disorder, and motor neuron uh, disease, because those conditions, obviously, they will have motor symptoms only. And the other way around, if someone has some sensory symptoms in their complaint, then that by itself would exclude the possibility of uh, motor neuron disease, like ALS, for example. Why would an ALS patient have any sensory symptoms? Um, uh, as part of their ALS. It's purely motor neuron disease. Same for myopathy. Muscles have, do not cause any numbness or tingling. So <clears throat> now again, we're always talking about a one etiology behind the symptoms. In real life, you're going to have cases where you know people may have two different things going on at the same time, like some diabetic neuropathy that's developing, and on top of that, they're having some myopathy. So of course, you know, things can may not be straightforward um, in, in real life. But uh, generally speaking, f f most of the time, even in real life, and always in the exam, um, uh, you're going to have uh, uh, the, you, you have to consider that, that, that this is only The most important test that you do um, in any time we suspect peripheral nervous system problem is um, EMG and nerve conduction study. So this is kind of the equivalent to getting brain or spinal cord imaging when we're dealing with the central nervous system. Uh, <clears throat> now it's important to keep in mind that uh, nerve conduction studies uh, do not, and, and even EMG, do not become abnormal right after a lesion in the peripheral nervous system. There is some delay and that is variable, but generally speaking, at least five to seven days after the onset of the lesion uh, need to pass before we start to see um, abnormalities on the nerve conduction study and EMG. Um, so uh, that will need to be kept in mind if we're dealing with a situation where we need uh, information right away to help us with the diagnosis or guide the management Then uh, and the symptoms just started within a day or two, then EMG nerve conduction study obviously is not the test that we can rely on uh, at that point. Uh, now, uh, the uh, this test consists of two uh, separate parts. They are completely separate. A nerve conduction study uh, assesses the nerves, and the electromyography 
uh, is when you put the needle um, in, in the muscles. Um, the uh, nerve connection study can be performed alone without an EMG and uh, you would still be able to get um, helpful information in, uh, in certain scenarios. Um, <clears throat> needle electromyography alone um, is uh, almost never done because the information will uh, not be complete and uh, it's hard to interpret uh, uh, the needle EMG without the presence of nerve conduction study. Uh, there is a technique called repetitive stimulation test that's not a routine a part of uh, um, the EMG nerve conduction study. So this part needs to be specified uh, when we want, uh, uh, want it to be performed. Uh, <clears throat> a repetitive stimulation test is done uh, for only one reason, which is to investigate for a neuromuscular junction uh, disorder. Uh, <clears throat> very briefly, uh, the nerve conduction study simply is based on stimulating one point of the nerve and recording uh, from another point. Usually that uh, recording point is distal to the stimulating point. And uh, we always do uh, a pre-measured distance between the recording point and the stimulating point. And if we know the distance, then we can calculate, or obviously the, the machine, the uh, nerve conduction study, uh, machine will calculate the conduction velocity, the amplitude and latency of the electric signal. Um, the uh, uh, nerve conduction study will help us uh, know a lot of information about the conductivity of the nerves from uh, the point of stimulation and more distally. Uh, it does not help with anything that or any lesion that could be more proximal to the uh, stimulating point. If we're stimulating at the wrist and someone has uh, a lesion at the elbow level, then the nerve conduction study will be completely normal because we're stimulating at the wrist and recording from the fingertip, for example. Um, the needle electromyography helps a lot uh, in uh, learning about the muscle, uh, the um, uh, motor unit action potentials, and if there's any muscle disease. Uh, in addition to that, it's very important and critical in assessing the uh, roots uh, disorders, radiculopathy, and the anterior horn cells, motor neuron disease. Uh, keep in mind that um, those two parts, even plexopathy to a large degree, um, they cannot be assessed by nerve conduction study. We cannot stimulate uh, these structures because you know, uh, plexus and roots are very deep, buried in, inside the, the neck and inside the, the chest or uh, pelvis, and uh, uh, anterior horn cells obviously cannot be stimulated. So the uh, when we do the nerve conduction study, and that study is normal, meaning the nerves themselves in the arm or the leg are normal, but the needle electromyography still shows signs of denervation in the muscle, that the muscle is not acting properly uh, the, these muscle fibers are denervated. That indirectly confirms that this denervation uh, source must be coming from a proximal structure, which is the root or the um, plexus or the motor unit, uh, the 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 uh, anterior horn cell. Uh, another important concept in the nerve connection study is uh, uh, which muscles are affected and which nerves are affected. So, for example, if <clears throat> um, the needle electromyography of multiple muscles if, is performed in the extremity and uh, two of these multiple muscles uh, show signs of denervation. Both muscles are, um, uh, let's say one muscle is innervated by the median nerve, the other muscle is innervated by the ulnar nerve. Both of them are abnormal. Then uh, this could mean that median and ulnar nerves, both of them are affected. However, if both muscles are innervated by, let's say, C7 uh, or C8, for example, radiculopathy or whatever root is that, then that would be the more logical explanation that this must be radiculopathy rather than both median and ulnar neuropathy at the same time. 
<clears throat> and the best way to confirm it is to test a muscle that is innervated by a median nerve also, but not by that specific root, let's say not by C8, a muscle that's innervated by median nerve and C6. If this was a median nerve, then this muscle must be abnormal. If this was C8, then this muscle must be completely normal. And that's how we can tell with um, uh, absolute accuracy uh, through the EMG nerve conduction study where is the problem in the peripheral nervous system. So we'll start with the motor neuron disease. And uh, again, um, motor neuron disease, uh, the hallmark is that you have uh, um, an involvement of the anterior horn cells, um, it's, whether it's an infectious or degeneration. Uh, sometimes, on top of that, you may have involvement in the corticospinal tract. And uh, that's typically in the degenerative cases, and which is ALS, obviously, uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. And uh, that's why we have in ALS upper and lower motor neuron uh, symptoms. Uh, but in any type of motor neuron disease, the anterior horn cells are or must be involved and affected. Uh, <clears throat> it's very important to keep in mind that the sensation is normal. Um, fasciculations are extremely important in uh, motor neuron disease. Uh, fasciculations are a feature of um, any uh, lower motor neuron disorder, so you can see it with neuropathy, myopathy, um, and radiculopathy. However, it's mostly prominent in motor neuron disease. So, uh, in exam, if you see someone talk about fasciculations, keep in mind things like ALS or polio or anterior horn cell disorders as very likely possibility. Now, if they're referring to tongue fasciculation specifically, then, they, then they're certainly referring to um, ALS. Uh, <clears throat> all motor neuron disease don't have any uh, effective treatment. Um, one thing to keep in mind when we're testing, uh, when doing the nerve conduction study in EMG, again, as we said, this is a, a, um, the most important test that you do to evaluate the peripheral nervous system. In motor neuron disease, nerve conduction study will be normal. Um, again, not absolutely, but, but largely speaking, we can say it will be normal. Uh, it's the needle electromyography that will show you some denervation features and some fasciculation um, potentials. <clears throat> so we'll start with uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS or what many people refer to as Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, this is a, a neurodegenerative uh, disorder, so the exact etiology and why does it happen in certain people and not in others is um, unclear. Um, uh, ALS um, hallmark is upper and lower motor neuron signs in a non-localizing pattern. The disease, generally speaking, is progressive in a subacute to even slow fashion sometimes. Um, when it starts or it's somewhat in relatively in its early stages, people may not have the upper and lower motor neuron signs uh, yet um, both existing. So that might be a little confusing. However, soon, uh, in a few months probably, uh, when the exam is repeated, uh, and obviously with the symptoms progressing, um, we're going to find some other features. Once we have both upper and lower motor neuron uh, features, uh, then this must be motor neuron dis degenerative uh, motor neuron disease affecting both corticospinal tract, giving the upper motor neuron signs, and anterior horn cells, whether in the spinal cord or in the brain stem, in the cr motor cranial nerves, uh, giving the lower motor neuron um, features. Um, the, um, uh, the ALS, uh, a lot of times, will start in one extremity, so someone will have, you know, um, weakness in an arm or a leg and some atrophy in it, uh, and then later on another extremity might be involved with, let's say, you know, a Babinski sign and, uh, and a clonus and maybe some weakness. Um, sometimes both upper and lower motor neuron signs 
may happen both of them in the same extremity uh, <clears throat> generally speaking the involvement is not symmetric it can be obviously but that's uh, but that's not necessarily the typical presentation um, a lot of times the ALS patients will have bulbar symptoms uh, meaning symptoms co coming uh, from involvement or damage uh, or problems with the uh, lower part of the brain stem uh, functions motor functions so uh, things like dysarthria and dysphagia uh, through involvement uh, of the uh, 12th and 10th uh, ninth cranial nerves um, and uh, commonly people may have a facial weakness also because of involvement of the uh, facial nerves uh, the the uh, uh, seventh cranial nerve so bulbar symptoms are common anytime someone presents with uh, dysphagia dysarthria um, especially if they have no other symptoms whatsoever ALS in addition to mycenae gravis those must be the top two differential diagnosis for dysarthria and dysphagia that is uh, slowly progressive obviously without any lesion that is seen on a brain MRI in the uh, brainstem. Um, generally speaking, um, in ALS, extraocular movements, they tend to be intact. Diplopia is not an issue. That is one feature that uh, distinguishes ALS um, from Mycenae gravis. Generally speaking, ALS is not confused easily by Mycenae gravis. Uh, those are really separate and different. But sometimes in early stages of both of them, they may present with similar features. However, diplopia it is a very typical and common presentation in mycenae gravis is rare in ALS. Um, as we mentioned before, if you see tongue atrophy or fasciculations, that's pathognomonic for ALS. Generally speaking, no cognitive deficit in ALS, uh, although recently the study suggests that there are some minor changes, in fact, actually, and those changes tend to have... Um, uh, a lot of uh, frontal and temporal features, uh, almost uh, sometimes in severe cases like uh, frontal temporal dementia. Obviously, there is no cure for ALS. It's mostly supportive treatment. Uh, typically, they will need um, uh, uh, pick and trach um, at some point. Um, there is uh, survival is usually short. Almost 50% of patients with ALS will die within three years of diagnosis. So that's kind of a number that we always uh, look at. However, survival can be up to five years. And there are some uh, uncommon or infrequent cases where people survived uh, more than that. However, when we talk about survival, um, a lot of this time will be uh, spent while the patient is extremely weak, probably bedridden, on the ventilator and uh, uh, fed with PEG tube. Um, the uh, uh, only available medication is called Rilazole and um, uh, it's FDA approved. Uh, <clears throat> it's an expensive medication. Uh, we need to consult the patient and clarify that uh, the expectations are low. Uh, this uh, medicine showed that it can delay the need for tracheostomy and it prolongs the um, survival of the patient by few months uh, while again the patient is most likely bedridden and on the another condition that affects interior home cells is uh, poliomyelitis so polio uh, is a virus that uh, was common in the past now uh, polio is largely almost completely um, eradicated not just in the u.s but in uh, vast parts of the world, including developing countries. Uh, so it is not that important issue anymore. However, we we need to keep it in mind, especially if we're facing a case of uh, people who uh, are um, uh, refugees. Uh, they were born and lived uh, their childhood in, um, in parts of the world where access to... Um, um, health care is very limited, especially you know, in uh, war-torn countries and, and these places. So a, a refugee coming from this area was developing a pure motor neuron, uh, lower motor neuron uh, weakness with the features of lower motor neuron. Um, it's something that we have to consider. 
um, uh, the, the big example is, uh, is what happened in uh, Syria recently. Um, the polio has been eradicated for more than two decades, and in the last two to three years there have been proven uh, cases that started to show up again because of the lack of vaccination. Uh, <clears throat> polio starts typically uh, or, or uh, affects the human body as a um, viral infection. Most of the time it does not cause any neurologic um, problems. Um, however, if it does, it will start uh, as a meningitis a picture, um, headache, uh, fever, um, um, uh, body aches, uh, neck stiffness, uh, meningeal features, and then followed by um, this diffuse weakness, it can affect some parts of the um, of the body, or it can affect the entire body. Obviously, um, the um, uh, weakness has low motor neuron features. Uh, it is accompanied by atrophy. Remember, atrophy does not happen right away. It takes time, sometimes several weeks before the atrophy develops. Um, the um, generally speaking. Uh, even when we have uh, poliomyelitis, um, the uh, prognosis is uh, overall is not bad. Uh, people tend to recover reasonably well. However, uh, there are severe cases where <clears throat> there will be permanent uh, paralysis and atrophy. Um, uh, the, uh, if we do CSF, the CSF will be consistent with uh, viral meningitis, and the polio antibodies will be positive both in the blood or in the CSF, or sometimes even in a pharyngeal uh, swab. Uh, polio is spread through uh, droplets uh, transmission and orofecal and transmission. <clears throat> uh, currently, we only use the um, um, uh, the um, killed uh, uh, virus um, uh, vaccine because there's been rare reports of the oral live attenuated vaccine uh, causing uh, polio. Um, the treatment is mostly supportive. Now, this might be actually more important than uh, polio. West Nile virus causing acute flaccid paralysis. <clears throat> um, this is a very rare complication of West Nile virus. Uh, however, because West Nile virus infection is uh, relatively uh, common, especially, I mean, obviously, only during summertime. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. Um, uh, again, just like polio, West Nile virus causes a viral syndrome. It doesn't necessarily ca uh, affect the uh, nervous system. Uh, however, if it does affect the nervous system, it, that would cause meningitis and or encephalitis. Uh, a patient will present, will present with a meningitis picture. Um, uh, CSF will show viral meningitis. Uh, West Nile virus antibodies are present in the CSF. A lot of times within a few days, uh, this patient very rapidly uh, will develop um, weakness, diffuse weakness, uh, flaccidity all over, decrease to absent reflexes, and um, that's what we call acute flaccid paralysis. Uh, it commonly involves the diaphragm and causes respiratory failure. It, generally speaking, this condition has a poor prognosis. Uh, the last example of motor neuron disease will be uh, a group of conditions we call spinal muscular atrophy, SMAs. Uh, there are multiple types of SMAs, and uh, they're mostly hereditary disorders. Uh, <clears throat> we will not uh, go in depth in, in these different types. Um, however, one of them is very important uh, to keep in mind or know something about. It is the uh, Werdenig hoffman disease. Uh, <clears throat> this is an autosomal recessive condition, like most of the spinal muscular atrophies. Um, it is the most common SMA, and also it's the most severe SMA. Um, it's actually probably about half of, uh, of all different SMAs that are reported. Uh, they, they are Werding Hoffman's uh, disease. Um, the, the reason to suspect that is uh, we have a floppy baby. Um, the floppy baby syndrome has a lot of different causes. Uh, floppy baby simply means that there is hypotonia, decreased tone, and uh, that um, can be seen in many different types of neuromuscular disorders that affect uh, uh, newborns. Uh, but, of course, that's not the only differential diagnosis. Some central nervous system disorders actually can present with floppy baby a lot of uh, genetic uh, problems. 
what one of the issues uh, or, or or differential diagnosis will be uh, the Verding Hoffman's disease. Uh, symptoms usually are present by um, uh, age of six months, and most children will die uh, at age of two. Um, uh, with with lot of complications, obviously there is no uh, treatment. Uh, <clears throat> so, if you want to know anything about uh, SMA spinal muscular atrophy, uh, think of Werding Hoffman's disease, autosomal recessive, floppy baby, uh, no treatment. It is a motor neuron disease. Now uh, we move to radiculopathy, and this is something that's encountered um, very frequently all the time. Uh, the problem here is obviously the spinal nerve roots. Um, before we talk about radiculopathy, I want to clarify a couple different points here. There's something called the central canal uh, and the neural foramina. I'm sure you're very familiar with that, but uh, let's make sure that this is clear again and we refresh it. Both of them can become stenosed or narrowed. And just like in the first uh, picture, illustrating picture, that you have on your left uh, lower corner. Um, the, the central canal is where the spinal cord uh, goes and uh, surrounded by CSF, obviously. And uh, uh, to have a central canal stenosis, uh, either the pedicles or the ligament in, in, uh, behind or the disc in the front uh, is going to bulge or ligament is thickened or something, and uh, this would cause compression on the spinal cord. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, what we call uh, spinal cord compression uh, because of central canal stenosis. And um, if this central canal stenosis happens in the lower part of the spine, in the lumbar uh, vertebrae, in the lumbar discs, um, or talking below L2, Simply that means that there is no more spinal cord at that level. Spinal cord ends around L1, L2. So if I have central canal stenosis at L3, 4, 5, S1, <clears throat> this will uh, compress not the spinal cord, obviously, but the roots, uh, the lumbar and sacral roots that are still traveling in the cistern down there. Um, and that's what we usually refer to as coda equina. Those roots. This is the coda equina. So if you have central canal stenosis at the lower level uh, of the lumbar spine, then you can have, uh, you do not have spinal cord compression, you have coda equina syndrome. Uh, <clears throat> that's one type, central canal stenosis. The other type would be neural foramina stenosis. Uh, the neural foramen is <clears throat> the space where the, uh, the uh, nerve, the spinal nerve or the root comes out. Um, of of the uh, the spine, uh, like what we see in the second picture. Um, again, we're starting from the left, going to the right. So, if you have stenosis there, this is what's going to give you radiculopathy, because we're pushing on a root. That's where radiculopathy happens. Uh, spinal cord compression does not cause a lot of pain, while radiculopathy causes a lot of pain. Um, and uh, when you have neural foramen stenosis, um, it will push on one root only. Now, if you have stenosis at more than one level, obviously you're going to have uh, more than one root pushed. And so it's either monoradiculopathy, which is usually most of the time that's what it is. When we say radiculopathy, we, means, we, we mean like it's one, one root. However, we can have polyradiculopathy, so multiple roots, either on the same side or on both sides sometimes have bilateral neural foramen stenosis at the same level. So people may have, um, let's say, uh, C7 uh, radiculopathy on both sides. Um, neural foramen stenosis is less concerning than spinal cord, uh, so, sorry, than uh, uh, central canal stenosis, because with central canal stenosis, we have spinal cord compression. People will have symptoms uh, <clears throat> from that level all the way down. Even with coda equina, when you have the stenosis, that will compress multiple roots at the same time that the roots that are traveling down rather than just um, one root. Um, another uh, uh, obvious point is that almost always radiculopathy is a mechanical etiology. There's compression. Um, the uh, thoracic spine and the um, 
uh, sacral uh, uh, part of the spine, except probably for S1 and rarely S2, uh, those areas you will rarely have radiculopathy in them. Um, it's mostly cervical and lumbar and up. Uh, a few other things about uh, radiculopathy, uh, of course, typically it's one extremity, or it, almost always it's one extremity. However, if it's bilateral, that, that certainly can happen. Um, there is always radical, radicular pain, uh, radiates from the neck or from the lower back, shoots down, commonly described as an electric-like uh, uh, pain or sharp shooting pain. Um, uh, it's very important to remember that the specific reflexes of that root, if that root has uh, corresponding reflexes, uh, those would be decreased or absent because this is a lower motor neuron condition. The root, uh, again itself, uh, will contain both motor and sensory fibers. But as long as it's damaged, obviously the motor fibers will be damaged and that will affect the reflexes and that will cause atrophy and so on. Um, the nerve connection study in radiculopathy is normal, while EMG, as we mentioned, will show denervation in any muscle that is sampled that is innervated by that specific root. While when you sample the other muscles that are innervated by different roots, those muscles will be, uh, the EMG with those muscles will be completely normal. Uh, down in this uh, couple uh, illustrating pictures here on the left side, um, you will see what do we mean by central canal stenosis, uh, where the spinal cord itself is compressed either from the back, the sides, or from the front. Uh, <clears throat> the, the next one uh, to your uh, right, uh, it will show you again uh, uh, in down there, uh, there the three red points um, are how the um, nerve or spinal cord can be injured. So you may have second ligament uh, that is pushing on the spinal cord itself, and that would be would account as cord compression and central canal stenosis. However, the um, roots themselves, those green structures, can be uh, compressed either because of a herniated disc um, compressing on the, on the root or because of uh, bone spurs that are compressing on the root. Um, on the right side, um, I just want you to uh, refresh your memory of different terms um, or conditions that you might read sometimes on X-ray reports or MRI or CT reports uh, or as diagnosis. So uh, we have degeneration or degenerated disc, we have bulging disc, but not necessarily herniated. We have a herniated disc uh, where there is rupture of the of the fibrous tissue um, uh, in the periphery of the disc. Uh, sometimes we have thinning in the disc itself without any bulging or herniation, and uh, sometimes we have uh, degeneration of the disc with osteophyte formation uh, on top of that. So now let's discuss the important um, uh, radiculopathies, starting with the cervical radiculopathy. Uh, <clears throat> if you have a C5 radiculopathy, a biceps reflex will be decreased or absent, um, and commonly, but not necessarily, the brachioradialis uh, reflex. Um, the sensory distribution is usually the anterolateral shoulder. It's only in the shoulder area. It never go be below the elbow, and it's typically on the lateral side. Uh, very important muscle that is involved is the deltoid, because no other radiculopathy will affect the deltoid other than uh, C5. Now, looking at C6, Brachioradialis uh, typically is decreased or absent, uh, however, uh, you may have also biceps. So, in a sense, both C5 and C6, both of them, they will affect the reflexes of biceps and brachioradialis to, uh, to some degree. Uh, again, you have the uh, uh, decreased decrease reflexes and uh, the sensory distribution is the lateral forearm, um, while the uh, C5 is lateral uh, shoulder area, 
the C6 is lateral, but it's in the forearm uh, itself. And uh, there's typically weakness with the biceps and weakness with the wrist extensors. Uh, with C7, uh, you will have problems with the triceps reflex. Uh, C7 sensory uh, distribution is the posterior uh, forearm. So that's, uh, that's really important. Uh, anytime you have sensory deficit um, in the posterior side of the arm and forearm, and we're talking about radiculopathy, then we're done. This must be C7. Uh, um, or probably we're talking about what else are in the exam. Then it must be decreased or absent triceps reflexes. Um, again, uh, the, the triceps um, muscle itself will be um, weak. Um, now going down to uh, lumbar and sacral radiculopathy, L1 and L2 are extremely rare and we're not going to talk about them. L3, L3 is also not very common. Uh, just remember that if you have uh, uh, pain and sensory deficit in the knee area, that is coming because of radiculopathy, then this must be uh, um, L3. L4 is very important because we have the patellar reflex, um, and if you have problems with L4, then you'll have decrease or absent uh, patellar reflex. Um, the um, uh, sensory distribution of L4 is um, the medial side of the leg, and uh, typically what's most important with L4 is that we have foot drop, weakness in the dors uh, foot dorsiflexion anterior tibialis. Um, the uh, foot drop happens either because of L4 radiculopathy or um, common perineal or fibular um, neuropathy. Um, now L5 uh, and S1, those are the by far the most common uh, two lumbar uh, uh, radiculopathies. <clears throat> L5, uh, the lateral uh, leg and the big toe um, are involved uh, as far as sensation and there is usually weakness of toe dorsiflexion. S1, uh, we have uh, problems with the Achilles reflex um, and uh, it affects the lateral uh, side of the foot um, there is also commonly uh, problems with eversion and plantar flexion we, we talked about um, Kuda Aquinas syndrome <coughs> again uh, here the lumbar roots um, that are traveling down uh, out of the spinal cord segments, uh, those roots are traveling down uh, in order to reach their corresponding um, neural foramina to exit from there. Uh, that's what forms the coda equina. And uh, if there is compression uh, in on this uh, group of roots uh, uh, centrally that causes this, the, the, the symptoms, um, the uh, typical symptoms would be bilateral involvement in both lower extremities. Uh, so it is polyradiculopathy, and again, it's usually bilateral. Uh, typically, there will be what we refer to as saddle anesthesia, so uh, proximal uh, bilateral lower extremities in addition to the perineal area um, uh, the, uh, that's innervated by the uh, sacral uh, uh, nerves. Uh, there's commonly urinary involvement typically with the urinary retention and there's decreased rectal tone again that's all because of the involvement of the uh, S1, S2 um, and sometimes S3 uh, roots. The treatment typically is surgical decompression. Uh, if someone has significant symptoms then the surgery must be done urgently. Now we're moving to the plexus and uh, that's what we refer to as plexopathy. Again uh, we have um, four plexopathies, uh, a possible plexopathies. We have two plexuses on uh, uh, both uh, uh, sides of the upper chest uh, below the clavicle. 
those are the brachial plexus and we have two lumbar circular plexuses in the pelvic area uh, close to the groin and uh, um, uh, typically plexopathy would be uh, only one plexus involvement bilateral symptoms are extremely uh, unlikely and uncommon uh, because by far the most common reason for plexopathy is mechanical compression and to have bilateral brachial or bilateral lumbosacral that's kind of uh, unusual um, it affects one extremity and uh, typically the symptoms are mixed uh, we just cannot have a pure sensory or pure motor presentation if someone has plexopathy because all these trunks and roots and uh, I mean and then divisions and uh, cords uh, those are all mixed uh, sensory motor fibers um, when do we suspect plexopathy so if someone has some sort of motor and sensory deficits uh, maybe a loss of some reflexes um, some atrophy in one extremity uh, this could be radiculopathy this could be um, mononeuropathy like carpal tunnel or, or ulnar or something so when do I suspect that this is plexopathy the reason we suspect plexopathy is uh, based on the physical exam if we feel that the sensory deficit does not follow a specific dermatome or a specific nerve distribution it, it doesn't fit with the median distribution it doesn't fit with the um, uh, radial distribution of sensory deficit uh, the muscles that are weak some of them are ulnar innervated some of them are radial innervated and some of them are uh, uh, median uh, innervated then <clears throat> maybe all of these nerves are affected but that's kind of odd what, what seems more likely in this case that it must be the plexus and that's why uh, multiple uh, different muscles are affected a nerve conduction study commonly is normal EMG will show denervation in multiple muscles but different from what we saw with radiculopathy and what we will see with mononeuropathies those muscles again they do not uh, belong to a specific root or a specific uh, nerve uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, a lot of these plexopathies especially if they are non-mechanical uh, not compression related uh, they start usually by severe pain in the plexus area whether in the groin or in the armpit that is followed uh, soon uh, within a day or two sometimes uh, with um, uh, sensory deficit and or uh, motor deficit uh, so remember this uh, <clears throat> uh, severe pain that precedes the uh, uh, onset of um, plexopathy especially in uh, inflammatory or autoimmune cases uh, those charts just to uh, refresh our memory of uh, uh, the brachial plexus and the lumbar and the sacral plexus uh, remember <coughs> a few important things a femoral nerve comes from the upper lumbar uh, uh, roots uh, mostly L2 L3 and L4 um, the tibial and uh, peroneal or fibular the newer name uh, nerves they both uh, uh, are uh, the two components of the uh, sciatic nerve and the sciatic nerve uh, originates uh, uh, primarily from the lower lumbar and the upper sacral roots um, so those are the two biggest nerves in the lower extremity the femoral nerve and the sciatic nerve think of femoral as relatively speaking upper lumbar uh, roots and the sciatic nerve is lower lumbar uh, slash uh, sacral uh, roots uh, here are some uh, etiologies of uh, plexopathies starting with the brachial plexopathy pancreas tumor <coughs> very important um, a patient who is a smoker for example and uh, or patients having weight loss and they present with um, uh, one extremity uh, right or left arm um, having a sensory deficit motor uh, weakness and on top of that there must be lower motor neuron signs to tell you that this is a peripheral nervous system uh, condition because it's lower motor neuron 
uh, then you have to consider pancreas tumor. You do chest x-ray or a CT scan of the chest. Uh, using crutches, sometimes that can cause brachial plexopathy on the long term. Uh, another very important one is thoracic outlet syndrome. When you have uh, the cervical rib, uh, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome has two types, uh, vascular, which is more common, and uh, neurogenic, which is less common. Neurogenic um, thoracic outlet syndrome is a, a type of plexopathy. Um, uh, any compression because of a mass in the upper chest, whether it's an abscess, a lymph node, a scar tissue, uh, anything. A trauma, especially if the arm is hyperextended, um, and uh, that that can cause uh, plexopathy, and of course difficult vaginal deliveries, uh, which we're going to talk about in the next slide. Uh, to just remember, clumpkies and uh, Herb Duchenne's uh, plexopathies. Um, the lumbosacral plexopathies, uh, pelvic tumors, uh, especially the um, uh, ovarian or uh, cervix uh, or bladder uh, tumors, those can push on the uh, lumbosacral uh, plexus. Retroperitoneal hematomas, uh, that's also um, uh, a possible etiology to cause compression. Post-surgical, uh, especially the gynae surgeries, um, sometimes uh, uh, even because of uh, uh, the positioning, uh, or uh, because of uh, some complications from the surgery, uh, just because of the anatomical proximity of the lumbosacral plexus to... Um, we will not go in depth in these two types of plexopathies. Both of them happen uh, <clears throat> as a result of uh, delivery complication. Uh, Clomcus palsy uh, is be uh, because uh, when the baby is born, uh, the arm is hyper abducted during the delivery. Herb Duchenne's palsy is actually the opposite. The arm is hyper adducted uh, during delivery. Uh, there's dystocia, basically, shorter dystocia uh, that is that happens here. Um, the uh, Herb Duchenne palsy, it's a superior plexus injury versus Clampkin's palsy, it's a lower uh, plexus um, uh, injury. Um, Clomkis uh, um, uh, plexopathy, very important to remember that it commonly happens with the Horner syndrome because of, of injury to the uh, sympathetic chain. <coughs> um, the pattern of muscle weakness uh, in each one uh, leads to a, a deformity uh, or abnormal position of the hand that uh, would give uh, this unique f description. Claw hand, we see it with Clonkis palsy, versus the waiter step hand, um, we see it with um, Herb Dish. The non-mechanical uh, causes of plexopathies are less common, however, they're very important. Um, diabetic uh, etiology, uh, that's one of the important ones. It's referred to as diabetic radicula, plexoneuropathy. So multiple parts of the uh, peripheral nervous system are involved uh, in diabetes. It used to be called diabetic amyotrophy. Um, the, um, it, it's, it usually happens in the lower extremities. Uh, it, the etiology can be autoimmune, it can be post-radiation sometimes. Um, however, out of the non-mechanical uh, plexopathies, the most common one would be the idiopathic. We're moving now to neuropathy, and that's a very important topic. <clears throat> I want to <coughs> think of neuropathy as three different groups. It's either that one nerve is affected, and that's what we call mononeuropathy, or multiple nerves that are affected in different parts of, of the body, uh, arms and legs, and that's what we refer to as polyneuropathy. The third type is multiple mononeuropathies. So instead of all the nerves are affected in, in um, legs and arms, um, it is one nerve affected here and there in a random way, um, uh, but not all of them. And that's what we refer to as multiple, multiple mononeuropathies or mononeuritis multiplex, mostly because the etiology most of the time is inflammatory. Um, mononeuropathies 
again it's usually one nerve involved almost always it's a mechanical compression on that nerve um, and uh, uh, each nerve has um, certain spots or, or areas where it can commonly get entrapped uh, but the lesion or entrapment does not always have to be in that uh, point so median nerve for example almost very commonly I would say it is entrapped at the level of the wrist uh, <clears throat> but it does not have to be there it can happen anywhere so we need to keep this in mind in case things do not fit well, fit well. Um, peripheral uh, polyneuropathy <coughs> uh, the involvement of the nerves is diffuse and symmetric in both arms both legs together uh, the etiologies are usually systemic um, things like diabetes alcohol and uh, thyroid uh, disorders and all the autoimmune conditions uh, and rheumatology conditions perineoplastic um, uh, vitamin deficiencies, medication induced, all these different etiologies. Uh, multiple mononeuropathies or mononeuritis multiplex, um, as we mentioned, it's commonly inflammatory etiology, <clears throat> and the involvement here is not related to, uh, it is not length dependent, so it does not follow a certain pattern. Uh, this will be a case of someone who developed uh, ulnar neuropathy, for example, last year, and then this year, a few months ago, comes with uh, uh, a peroneal neuropathy. Um, and then a couple months later, he is developing um, uh, the other side, femoral neuropathy, and now he's developing carpal tunnel syndrome. So within uh, several months, he's just having one mononeuropathy after the other. And uh, that's obviously odd, and that's what we refer to as mononeuritis multiplex. Um, every neuropathy uh, can be classified in multiple ways. So the same neuropathy, <clears throat> is it acute versus chronic? Did it develop within a few days or a week or two versus it's been gradual over several uh, months? Is it axonal or demyelinating or mixed? Uh, a lot of neuropathies are mixed actually. Um, is it sensory, pure sensory or pure motor? Or is it mixed? And again, uh, a lot of neuropathies are mixed, a sensory motor. Is it large fiber neuropathy or small fiber neuropathy? Uh, large fiber neuropathies are usually the neuropathies that we're, we're talking about right now. Uh, uh, we can prove them, diagnose them, or exclude the diagnosis based on the nerve conduction study and the EMG. Um, the small fiber neuropathies are uh, the ones that affect the small fibers, the C fibers, unmyelinated fibers. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, last uh, way to classify and look at uh, the same neuropathy is, is it acquired or is it uh, inherited? So uh, some examples, for example, uh, when we talk about hereditary neuropathy, we have to think of about uh, Charcot-Marie tooth. That's uh, <coughs> Uh, biggest example of uh, hereditary neuropathy. Uh, Charcot-Marie Tooth uh, obviously has different uh, types. However, generally speaking, we think about it as a demyelinating neuropathy, although it has some axonal uh, 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 types. Uh, small fiber neuropathy, um, it refers to the unmyelinated uh, neuropathies or C fibers. Uh, unmyelinated, I mean fibers or C fibers. And uh, uh, those are heavily involved in a pain signal. So small fiber neuropathies commonly are referred to as painful neuropathies. Um, in acute neuropathy, uh, the, the biggest differential uh, <clears throat> will be Guillain-Barré syndrome and toxic neuropathies when there is an exposure to, to uh, a medication or chemotherapy or toxin. Um, the neuropathy progresses rapidly. Uh, or otherwise, most other neuropathies are subacute to chronic. Uh, as far as sensory versus motor, uh, the mixed type is by far the most common type of all neuropathies. Um, the, generally speaking, if you have uh, damage to the uh, myelin sheet but the axon is still intact, then you're better off and have better 
chance of recovery than when you have an axonal neuropathy with damage to the axon. Uh, <clears throat> small fiber neuropathies, uh, EMG neuropathy study is completely normal. The diagnosis is usually through skin biopsy <clears throat> to check the density of the small fibers um, in the skin. Large fiber neuropathies, uh, obviously the uh, EMG neuropathy study is abnormal. Um, and uh, in axonal neuropathy, uh, what we have is um, reduced amplitude and reduced conduction velocity. So the signal uh, uh, is uh, uh, amplitude decreases uh, when uh, <coughs> in axonal neuropathy, uh, not the whole signal is being uh, conducted because the axon is damaged. Uh, when in demyelinating neuropathies, what we have is specifically prolonged latency. So there is delay in conducting the signal. Uh, EMG in both types, uh, axon demyelinating, uh, will show um, uh, denervation signs. <clears throat> Diabetic polyneuropathy um, is uh, typically length dependent. It starts in the distal parts of the feet and then gradually progresses symmetrically uh, uh, approximately toward the ankles and then above the ankles toward the knees uh, and then it can continue above the knees in, in severe cases. Usually once it arrives to the knees level, uh, the neuropathy will start to show up in the hands um, and progresses toward the wrists. Um, <clears throat> obviously there is weakness, hyperflexia and uh, 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 some atrophy. Um, uh, in addition to uh, uh, the sensory and motor symptoms, uh, gait ataxia, which we refer to as sensory ataxia, is a very common uh, symptom. Sometimes even the main complaint can be uh, the uh, off-balance feeling, which turns out to be uh, due to the loss of proprioception sense because of the neuropathy. Um, with diabetes, you can have large fiber neuropathy, but also uh, patients can have the autonomic neuropathy, uh, which symptom-wise can cause uh, GI motility problems, uh, can cause <coughs> sweating problems, and uh, orthostatic uh, blood pressure problems, because uh, um, those are all uh, innervated through the, or controlled through the autonomic nervous system. So, um, Guillain-Barré syndrome, um, or what's officially called acute inflammatory demyelinating uh, polyneuropathy, um, this is a very important uh, uh, condition uh, that uh, uh, presents as an acute neuropathy. I know it is typical uh, to think about uh, Guillain-Barré uh, syndrome as an ascending paralysis, um, and that, that kind of feature is very important. But what's more important than that, actually, is to, to simply understand that it is a neuropathy. So you would expect some weakness and or uh, sensory deficit, like numbness, tingling, uh, loss of sensation, or even pain. And because it's neuropathy, you would certainly expect decreased or absent reflexes um, in, uh, in the lower extremities. Because it's a neuropathy, you would expect it to start distally and progress proximally, and that's what the ascending um, feature comes from. And uh, what's unique about it, it's an acute neuropathy. Uh, acute mean, means it progresses uh, fairly quickly, so over uh, over a few days. So that's where that, uh, that feature of ascending weakness or uh, numbness or tingling come from. Uh, <clears throat> if things are not clearly ascending, uh, but it's more of a progressive, uh, rapidly progressive sort of neuropathy, then Guillain-Barré still must be considered as very likely a uh, possibility. Uh, commonly happens uh, after a viral infection or Campylobacter uh, uh, gastroenteritis. Uh, it is uh, a demyelinating uh, neuropathy that's very important, um, and uh, it has generally a very good prognosis. Most cases recover well, uh, unless, you know, the, the case was uh, fulminant and severe. Um, the uh, uh, diagnosis, um, you can do 
uh, EMG nerve connection study, and that will show the demanding features, but remember that will not become abnormal before probably five to seven or even 10 days after onset. So the best way is if we want to increase our suspicion, a diagnosis is mostly clinical, but if we want to increase the suspicion uh, uh, and, and uh, feel more comfortable that this is GBS, we need to do a spinal tap, and uh, the spinal tap will show <clears throat> the inflammatory pattern in the CSF, which is usually elevated protein with a slightly elevated white blood cells, if not completely normal sometimes. And those white blood cells, if they are elevated, they will be lymphocytes. Um, the uh, uh, treatment is IVIG or plasma freezes. Um, always remember, steroids have no role in treatment uh, of uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, very important to monitor negative inspiratory force and uh, vital capacity as part of the uh, pulmonary function tests uh, uh, every sometimes 12 hours or even every 6 hours, especially if the patient is having some uh, respiratory symptoms because the uh, respiratory failure can uh, progress uh, very quickly sometimes. The chronic form of this inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, we call it CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the, the difference is simply Guillain-Barre is a monophasic condition, so it happens once and then recovers and it should not happen again. If someone comes with another uh, Guillain-Barre a few months, a few years after the onset of the first one, uh, comes with another attack, or uh, on the other hand, if someone uh, uh, had Guillain-Barre and it's been more than eight weeks and there has not been clear significant improvement uh, doesn't have to be back to normal but just clear improvement after eight weeks if we do not see that uh, that's when we start to suspect uh, CIDP so recurrent uh, sort of Guillain-Barre uh, presentations or a Guillain-Barre presentation that is not improving uh, after eight weeks uh, here, in addition to doing the IVIG and plasma exchange uh, and the steroids, which can be used in CIDP, a uh, patient will need to be uh, on immune suppressant uh, chronically. Um, now we will uh, quickly uh, go over some of the common mononeuropathies uh, and uh, starting with the median nerve mononeuropathy, carpal tunnel syndrome, uh, very common. Uh, median nerve can be uh, compressed anywhere in its course. However, uh, compression at the uh, um, wrist is the most common when it goes through the carpal tunnel. Uh, this is the most common uh, location. Uh, it, it typically happens because of overuse of the wrist. Uh, so typing, for example, um, lifting things, uh, even if they're not very heavy, but if we do that all the time, uh, pushing things, you know, working with machines or... Uh, uh, or sometimes, you know, people, if they use wheelchair, for example, um, any repetitive trauma uh, to, to the wrist, <clears throat> even if it's minor. Uh, diabetes increases the chance of all focal mononeuropathies. Uh, so diabetic people have um, uh, are, are at high risk of having um, um, things like uh, median uh, neuropathy, like carpal tunnel syndrome, or ulnar neuropathy, and, and so on. Um, and it also happens in pregnancy. So pregnant women starting to have you know symptoms in their hand, you think uh, <coughs> carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, commonly, you have a thinner atrophy because of the abductor pollicis brevis uh, atrophy, and this uh, atrophy again only happens after uh, uh, several weeks of a significant lesion that is affecting uh, uh, the nerve. So mild cases do, certainly do not expect any uh, to see any atrophy. If you see an atrophy. Uh, just like in, in this picture here, that means uh, even before you do the nerve conduction study, that means that this is a severe advanced case of, of uh, carpal tunnel. Uh, the uh, 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 sensory distribution of the median nerve is obviously the, f the first three digits. Um, Phalan sign and tenosine can be done clinically, try to uh, elicit uh, the symptoms. Uh, commonly people, <coughs> they would say, uh, if they are... Uh, driving for a long distance, they may feel um, uh, the symptoms coming on if they are holding their hands on the steering wheel, uh, or uh, while they're asleep, they wake up from sleep uh, because their hand 
is uh, is numb, tingly, and uh, is hurting. Uh, any hyperextension or reflection of the wrist would trigger the symptoms. Um, again, these si clinical signs are not always reliable. The treatment, uh, trying to avoid, uh, you know, the hyperextension flexion. That's why you know wrist brace is commonly the first step. If that doesn't help, steroid injection, and the last uh, step, obviously, would be the surgical release. Uh, now, ulna neuropathy uh, is also uh, a common type of neuropathy. Uh, the ulna nerve at the elbow uh, uh, goes through the cubital tunnel. Uh, so, the most common location of ulna neurop uh, compression is at the elbow level. The sensory deficit is uh, on the other side um, of, uh, of the hand. So, we said median nerve is the first three digits, actually three and a half to, uh, exactly. The ulnar nerve is the fourth and fifth digits uh, sensory distribution, so on the medial side of the hand. Uh, again, remember the sensory distribution can vary, uh, sometimes a lot, so uh, this is, we're here going with the most common sensory distribution, but there's always some variability. Uh, in advanced cases, you see, you do not see thinner atrophy, you would see the hypothenar atrophy, which is on the other side of the hand, um, uh, and again, that's in advanced cases. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, uh, as far as uh, the weakness, uh, you see what we refer to as claw hand because of involvement of different types of muscles um, in the um, uh, hand. So as you see, as you see in the in the picture uh, down, the um, uh, the fingers, uh, fourth and fifth fingers, are extended. Um, uh, at the uh, initially and then they're flexed uh, distally so proximally they're extended and uh, distally they're flexed simply because of the weakness of the extensors of um, uh, this fourth and fifth finger claw hand we see it also in plexopathy uh, in clamp case plexopathy but this claw hand uh, and that claw hand are slightly different actually uh, as far as the shape, but both of them, they will give you that kind of uh, impression. It's it's uh, like a claw. Um, what's uh, uh, common also is uh, atrophy, in, uh, not just in the hypothenar area, but in the first dorsal interosseous, as we see in the picture. Uh, the biggest differential diagnosis for ulnar neuropathy is medial epicondylitis, where people would have pain at the elbow, just like with ulnar neuropathy, the pain could radiate on the medial side, uh, of the uh, uh, forearm, and that's also common uh, with ulnar neuropathy, and there could be also some numbness, tingling with it. So everything would, would be suggestive of ulnar neuropathy, but uh, uh, in these cases, EMG nerve connection studies will be completely normal, uh, suggesting that this must be a tennis elbow rather than ulnar neuropathy. Uh, radial neuropathy uh, <coughs> is uh, also an important uh, type of neuropathy. It can happen um, whenever there is compression on the radial nerve that runs uh, um, uh, loops around the uh, the humerus, and uh, when it goes through the spiral groove uh, in the mid humerus, uh, this is the most common location of um, compression of the radial nerve. But obviously, that's not the only uh, compression site. Uh, this is the most uh, the most common one. Um, the sensory deficit is. Uh, on the posterior side of the arm and hand. So uh, that's what distinguishes uh, radial neuropathy from all other neuropathies. Uh, median and ulnar, you're talking only in the hand and uh, either first three digits or uh, last two digits. Radial neuropathy, everything you're talking about as far as sensation is on the dorsum of the hand and on the posterior uh, aspect of the uh, arm and forearm. And uh, from, as far as weakness, you get wrist drop, um, uh, extensors, the wrist extensors weakness, uh, <clears throat> and also the finger extensors. So whenever we see wrist drop, then we're thinking uh, radial neuropathy. Uh, femoral neuropathy, uh, it can happen because of trauma or pelvic mass that pushes on the femoral nerve, uh, which is more kind of an anterior <coughs> uh, nerve in the pelvis. And uh, uh, it can happen after uh, uh, surgery, especially the uh, GYN surgeries. Uh, the uh, uh, sensory deficit is in the anterior thigh, uh, 
uh, always think of femoral nerve as anterior, sciatic nerve is posterior as far as sensation. So the anterior aspect of the thigh is mostly femoral nerve, um, and uh, that's when you have where you have numbness, tingling, and and pain. Uh, the weakness is related uh, to the quads weakness plus minus the iliopsoas. So uh, both of these are flexors, uh, hip flexors, and uh, I mean the iliopsoas is hip flexor. The uh, quadriceps are knee extensors. But uh, both of them, what they do is they basically help us. Uh, bend the, the knee and go up stairs. So if someone is having uh, problems going upstairs um, and uh, they feel like their knee is buckling, one of the first things to, to uh, question is possibility of femoral neuropathies. Um, uh, femoral nerve is involved in the patellar, uh, patellar reflex and that's very important uh, because we lose the, uh, the knee reflex here. So anytime, remember, anytime we have... Uh, uh, loss of the knee reflex, patellar reflex, you think either uh, L4 radiculopathy or femoral neuropathy. Um, now, this is not uncommon, uh, neuralgia parasitica, uh, <coughs> it has a fancy name, the lateral femoral cutaneous uh, nerve runs underneath the um, uh, inguinal ligament and uh, it is a pure sensory nerve uh, it, it goes to the anterolateral aspect of the thigh between the hip all the way to the knee uh, and uh, people may have um, numbness tingling and pain in uh, in that area and that's uh, what we call neuralgia parasitica compression on the lateral cutaneous uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve um, the, it happens in, in patients who, have, who are obese, especially if they have central obesity. So there's a lot of fat that's, uh, uh, when they sit, even when they stand, it's pushing on the uh, uh, groin area. Uh, or if they, have, if they tend to wear you know, tight belts or, or pants, it can happen after trauma. Uh, treatment is either medication to help with the, with the symptoms if they're mild, or um, uh, nerve block um, to the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, sciatic neuropathy, or what's referred to as sciatica, uh, I want to clarify one uh, confusing uh, picture here. Uh, commonly, uh, sciatica is referred to uh, uh, mistakenly, uh, or is used mistakenly as a term to describe someone who has uh, uh, lumbar or sacral radiculopathy, like L5 or S1 radiculopathy, and we say that this patient has sciatica. And the reason is because uh, in... Uh, in these radiculopathies, people will have this uh, radiating shooting pain from the back down. Uh, if it's more on the posterior aspect of the <coughs> thigh and leg, it, it really sounds like sciatica. Um, so, so we need to be a little careful when we use that term. What do we mean exactly? Sciatic neuropathy, uh, the problem is not at the level of the roots. Uh, it is not radiculopathy. This is a neuropathy. So the sciatic nerve, which is outside the spine, uh, in the posterior aspect of the pelvis, um, the, uh, there's a problem with the sciatic nerve. The sciatic nerve is the <coughs> uh, origin of both uh, the uh, uh, tibial nerve and the fibular nerve, uh, uh, which is the common perineal nerve. Uh, however, the symptoms uh, that people have with sciatic uh, neuropathy are predominantly uh, fibular uh, uh, symptoms or, or common perineal symptoms. Um, the, the pain radiates from around the hip area, sometimes close to the low back. That's what creates some confusion between lumbar radiculopathy and sciatic neuropathy, and it radiates down uh, through the leg. It tends to be more on the posterior aspect of, of the thigh and leg rather than anterior or lateral, uh, like what we talked about in the femoral and lateral femoral cutaneous nerves. Um, the uh, uh, patients uh, may have a uh, foot drop. It is not uncommon. Uh, so keep this in mind, foot drop, we always think uh, of um, uh, peroneal neuropathy, fibular nerve neuropathy. Uh, but again, remember sciatic neuropathy, that's the origin of the uh, 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 peroneal nerve. It can give a foot drop. Uh, and uh, sometimes they may have Achilles reflexes, uh, uh, high, uh, um, gone or absent. Um, it is commonly uh, caused by prolonged um, 
uh, sitting on hard surfaces, you know, prolonged compression to the to the sciatic nerve. Uh, a peroneal neuropathy or fibular neuropathy, that's where we see foot drop typically. Uh, <clears throat> remember foot drop, you think uh, peroneal neuropathy, L4 radiculopathy, um, and uh, uh, occasionally sciatic neuropathy. Um, and remember with L4 radiculopathy, you would lose um, reflex, uh, the, the knee reflexes uh, versus with fibular or peroneal neuropathy, the knee uh, reflex is uh, intact. That's how you can tell the difference clinically. Um, it commonly happens because of crossing legs as a habit, you know, one time after the other, day after day, uh, for a long time, then uh, there will be some damage to the um, peroneal nerve. Um, or because of knee injuries, because the compression is at the um, head of the uh, fibula. And uh, um, the uh, uh, patients will develop weakness in the uh, foot dorsiflexion, which is anterior tibialis, and uh, that leads to foot drop. Uh, the uh, sensory deficit is on the lateral aspect of the leg rather than the thigh. So it's all from the knee and down uh, to the foot. So <clears throat> disorders of the neuromuscular junction, um, they cause obviously only motor symptoms. There's only weakness. There's no <clears throat> sensory deficit or pain. Um, the neuromuscular junction is where an electric signal coming through the um, nerve, the neuron, um, will be transferred into a chemical signal uh, with the acetylcholine uh, being released uh, in the synaptic cleft to... Um, uh, bind to the acetylcholine receptors um, in the um, uh, neuromuscular junction in the muscle, and uh, that will trigger an, ect an electric signal again, the uh, action potential in the muscle fibers. Uh, <clears throat> so electric signal transformed to chemical signal to trigger another electric signal. Um, fatigability of the muscles is the hallmark of a neuromuscular junction uh, disorder. Um, and uh, it does not have to be just that toward the end of the day that the muscles get weak, but it could be even within a few minutes of the use of the muscle or, uh, you know, <coughs> uh, frequent use of the muscle, the muscle gets weak. And then after rest for a while, it may improve some. Uh, EMG and nerve conduction study, both of them would be normal in, in uh, these uh, disorders. That's where we need the repetitive stimulation test to make a diagnosis. There's another technique uh, <coughs> called single fiber EMG, uh, that's also very helpful to make a diagnosis of a neuromuscular junction disorder, um, uh, but that's a very specific uh, type of technique. Uh, Mycenae gravis, Lambert-Eaton syndrome, and botulism, those are the common neuromuscular junction disorders. So we'll talk about the important ones. Mycenae gravis, it's an uh, autoimmune uh, condition. Uh, there are antibodies against the acetylcholine uh, receptors whether these are blocking antibodies, binding antibodies. Uh, <clears throat> um, the, the other type is called anti-mask antibodies. In the past, there were about 15, 20% of the Mycenae gravis uh, cases where uh, they were uh, considered seronegative uh, because the acetylcholine antibodies were uh, absent in them. However, um, it was found that there is another type of antibodies. So both together we refer to commonly as Mycenae gravis uh, antibodies panel. Um, it, it is very common that Mycenae gravis patients uh, have thymoma, and, uh, 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 which is a, a, a growth in the thymus gland, a gland in the, in the upper chest. And uh, uh, a lot of times uh, thymectomy alone will significantly uh, improve, if not cure, the symptoms of uh, Mycenae gravis. So it's very important to look for thymoma. Um, there are different types for Mycenae gravis. <clears throat> uh, we all think of the generalized uh, type. However, the ocular Mycenae gravis is a very important um, type, and uh, we see it frequently. That's when people present with uh, droopiness of the eyelid, double vision, uh, disconjugate gaze, the eyes movements are not right, and that's what gives them, obviously, is double vision. So uh, there's really no other symptoms uh, in, in their, uh, in their uh, body, no weakness in the arms or legs, nothing else. Uh, that's the ocular um, Mycenae gravis. It certainly can remain ocular type forever and never progress to uh, generalized type, but uh, uh, there's certainly a chance that it may progress later on. 
um, uh, this uh, ptosis and diplopia again will have the fatigability features um, that things might be a little better in the morning but then they get worse toward uh, you know noon and afternoon the other type is the bulbar so these people may or may not have a lot of diplopia and, and ptosis but their main symptoms actually are dysarthria dysphagia and facial weakness uh, which means an involvement of the uh, levels of the uh, seventh cranial nerve and the uh, ninth tenth uh, and, and twelfth cranial nerves now remember the problem here is not the nerves themselves this is not a cranial neuropathy for example the problem is those nerves are taking the signals, but the muscles that are innervated by those nerves, um, they are not uh, triggering any uh, action potential because the acetylcholine uh, is, is not working in the synaptic uh, cleft. Uh, so that's the bulbar type. Uh, uh, the generalized type is obviously when uh, different parts of, of the extremity muscles uh, are involved, and typically you will have proximal more than distal muscles involvement. In the generalized type, you commonly also will have uh, diplopia and uh, ophthalmoparesis and ptosis. Uh, also, dyspnea, shortness of breath, and sometimes even respiratory failure can be seen in this type or obviously in any other type. So those types are not very distinct from each other. It's kind of a spectrum, but we're talking about the initial presentation. It can be mostly in the eye uh, problems or mouth, face, swallowing, speech problems, or generalized weakness. Um, the diagnosis of uh, Mycena gravis uh, uh, relies on um, checking the antibodies in the serum, and uh, uh, they are uh, highly sensitive and specific. Uh, the only problem, it takes time, it takes a few days, if not uh, even a week. Um, the, uh, if we need a, more, a sooner um, uh, confirmation of the diagnosis, then we can do the tensilin test, a drophonium test. A drophonium is a short-acting um, uh, anti-cholinergic, uh, uh, and uh, the um, uh, once we give it through the IV instantly, within half a minute uh, to a minute, you're going to see clear improvement, and the muscles become much stronger, symptoms improve, and that may last for a few minutes and then would go away. Uh, and the symptoms come back the way they were. So if we see that, that's very confirming. Now, um, when you, when you want to do a tensile test, you want to make sure that you have some objective findings that uh, will likely improve and can be and the improvement can be measured uh, easily. So someone has ptosis, you can easily see that the eyelid is not droopy anymore. Someone has, sees double and then within a minute of administering the medication, now the double vision is gone or it's much better, uh, you know, these kind of things. But if you have someone who has profound weakness in the arms and legs and you give them a dose uh, or two of the uh, hydrophonium, uh, it's very unlikely it will be strong enough to show you clear improvement in, uh, in their weakness. And in this case, not seeing improvement doesn't mean that the uh, patient does not have mycenic gravis. So we need to... Uh, be careful in when to choose using this test. Uh, another method will be doing repetitive stimulation test, and uh, uh, <coughs> you will uh, uh, stimulate a nerve, let's say the median nerve, and record uh, from a muscle, uh, record the action potential from a muscle that is uh, innervated by this nerve, uh, let's say the epidactyl pollicis brevis. So when you give the first uh, stimulation, you're going to get a, a motor, in a, 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 you'll get a compound action potential. You give a second one right away after, and a third one, and a fourth one, and a fifth one. So you keep stimulating the muscle again and again and again. Normally, the uh, compound action, uh, motor action potential, the CMAP, should always remain uh, about the same. The muscle should be able to generate contractions uh, uh, over and over 10 times, let's say, in, in 10 seconds. In, uh, in people with uh, mycenae gravis, uh, that's not going to be the case. Uh, you start with a bigger um, uh, CMAP, bigger amplitude of the uh, motor uh, action potential, and then uh, the more you stimulate, the smaller the amplitude gets. That's what we call decrement. Uh, and if we see that pattern, that is uh, definitely a confirming of Mycenae gravis. Um, again, we want to make sure we choose the test uh, in the right uh, cases. So if someone has diplopia and ptosis, 
well, those muscles cannot be stimulated and, and recorded from. So uh, if you order a repetitive stimulation test on the left or right upper extremity in someone who has ocular myasthenia gravis, that test can certainly be completely normal. That does not rule out myasthenia gravis. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the last thing that's very important to do is a CT of the chest to look for thymoma. Um, the uh, treatment for myasthenia gravis, uh, three main things. You need to strengthen the muscle um, uh, through uh, peridostigmine um, or neostigmine, uh, any, any of those uh, uh, medication that will increase acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft. Um, you want to uh, treat the root cause of the problem, which is an autoimmune process. So you want to uh, use immunosuppression uh, with whatever medication that you will pick. Um, and uh, you want to look for thymoma. And if there is thymoma um, or thymus hyperplasia, you, you want to uh, remove the thymus because that uh, commonly is a trigger of the autoimmune process. Um, so uh, every patient will have to have uh, these three approaches at the same time. Um, uh, when people come with myasthenia gravis crisis or exacerbation, when things are really severe, uh, then the treatment will be uh, any of the plasmapheresis or IVIG or high dose of IV steroids um, until uh, we, uh, we get rid of this uh, uh, excessive uh, attack of antibodies. Um, and then you try to focus on uh, strengthening the muscles with <coughs> maybe adjusting the dose of paradostigmine. With myasthenia gravis crisis, just like with any neuromuscular uh, condition, you want to be very careful monitoring the uh, pulmonary function tests, uh, the NIF and vital capacity to ensure that they're not deteriorating. Uh, and uh, if they are, they will need elective intubation. Uh, Lambert-Eaton syndrome is another type of mycenic, uh, of, uh, of uh, neuromuscular junction disorders. It's a paraneoplastic syndrome, so uh, anytime we reach this diagnosis or we suspect it, uh, we need to look for uh, lung cancer, specifically small cell lung cancer. Uh, so we do a CT of the chest. And on uh, the other way around, if you have someone who's a smoker, for example, or history of, of cancer, and they're developing uh, weakness, uh, then you have to suspect lambert eden syndrome um, as a differential diagnosis there. Again, the fatigability of the muscles is a very important feature. Now, um, we want to be uh, careful with the, with the lambert eden syndrome um, uh, presentation because uh, we know that um, frequent stimulation of the muscle will um, improve the acetylcholine function in the synaptic cleft <clears throat> and give you a better uh, compound motor ion action potential, but that entirely depends on the frequency of that stimulation. Um, so overall, in from a clinical standpoint, uh, the people, uh, the patient will be getting weaker with the further use of uh, of their uh, uh, muscles. Uh, not necessarily they, they get stronger with that. Uh, the diagnosis is based on repetitive stimulation test. Um, and that would show an increment in the compound motor unit action potential when we use it at a certain frequency, when we do the test at a certain frequency. The treatment is obviously immunosuppressant uh, uh, with uh, multiple different medications. You could also use IVIG or plasmapheresis.